Good and gracious God, I just ask that um, these words that you have given me will touch the hearts of your people. Lord, um, let no one is here. May their time not be wasted, but Lord, may they hear the gospel message as you would like them to hear. And I pray that it falls on open hearts this morning. Lord, I ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, um, the words of Jesus in the gospel lesson today, in the what's often referred to as either the parable of the weeds, or it's also known as the wheat and the tares. It presents a lot of difficult truths. They're challenging to us as believers, and they're challenging to the church. And they are also, as I discovered, amazingly relevant to our time. You know, Jesus wants to talk to believers about the coexistence of good and of evil. And there is a, what I think is just a readily apparent connection here with what we see today. The existence of evil is prevalent all around us, maybe even more so than the existence of the good. We're dealing with COVID-19 and the riots and destruction that's brought out some of some wonderful things, some stories of hope and courage, but it's also brought out the dark side and how corrupt human beings, some human beings, can be. And these observations, you might say, in our society and in our culture around us, they're easy enough to see, right? I mean, we look out and we readily see them, but it's when we begin to deal with the nature of the church and individual believers that things start to get a little bit more foggy and a little bit more complicated. Bear with me here. Our churches, okay, are far from pure. Why? Because... They're full of sinners. All of us are sinners. In fact, one definition I like, you've probably heard it before, it bears repeating, but the church is not a, hosp- is a hospital for sinners, not a museum for the saints, right? That's what we're supposed to be. But there are differences among sinners. Some sinners are believers, while others aren't. They simply choose not to believe. They walk away. Thus, the state of the church as we experience it is mixed. It's mixed at best. Uh, And that's generally, by the way, it should be seen as a good thing. After all, you know, for a a biblically focused church, which I hope and pray that we are, um, we're focused on such things as discipleship. That is, we're supposed to be making disciples. And we're supposed to be focused on evangelism. It's spreading the gospel news of the kingdom out there, getting it out there uh, just about any way we can. We're, we're concerned with imitating Jesus Christ in the world. And to do it in not only in word, but in our deeds. People need to see our actions, right? Uh, and, and that's good that we have unbelievers who, are, who may exist within the church who we're witnessing to. So the problem isn't with unbelievers in the church. The problem is with unbelievers who, who deliberately sow strife and dissension among us, right? I recently watched a disturbing movie for the second time only because it's so instructional. Maybe you've heard of it. It's been out there a number of years, The Devil's Advocate. Okay, it stars Keanu Reeves. He plays an aspiring Florida defense lawyer named Kevin Lomax, and he accepts this high-powered position in a New York law firm headed by uh, legal shark John Milton. He's played by Al Pacino, okay? And uh, uh, he's really, in reality, he's Satan in disguise. Now, Kevin's wife, Marianne, is played by Charlize Theron. I don't know if that's the right pronunciation or not. Um, But she becomes subject to Milton's co-workers who immediately start working on her to create doubt in her mind about her choices and about her own physical attractiveness. Now, she is a beautiful woman, but we discover, disturbingly, that she's so vulnerable. Their intention of the Milton's workers here is pure evil, and it's unsettling to see Marianne's character digress until she is confined at the end to a mental institution. Now, while this might be exaggerated, I mean, it's Hollywood after all, right? I, I can say this, I've been taken aback on several occasions by people who claim to be believers, and again, I don't want to judge, but they're capable of sowing great hurt and deception. 
I can recall a situation in my last congregation where one discontent member left and then proceeded to try and steal away or take away and lure others away from the church that I was serving to the new church that she'd chosen. Now, I might add that this person was known to continually sow discontent in churches and in the community. So, by telling us the parable of the wheat and the tares, Jesus says, our situation is like a field of wheat into which an enemy deliberately goes out of their way to sow seeds and has, in fact, worked very hard at it. We can't underestimate that. Now, it'd be a whole lot easier if the weeds, in this case, were readily recognizable, right? Um, But that's not the case. The weeds that people in biblical times contended with was something, it was something called bearded darnel. It's identical to the wheat. It can't even be recognized by veteran and seasoned farmers until the head comes on the wheat and the weeds. The, the tares, um, or the darnel in this case, the, the, that head stood straight up while the, uh, the head on the wheat would bend a little bit. So um, this left the farmer with two choices. And both of them weren't very good when you stop to think about it, right? Uh, Either they could leave the weeds in place and allow them to hamper the growth of the wheat, or they could pluck the weeds out and in the process uproot the good wheat along with them. It demonstrates, I think, to us sometimes, as I was reflecting on this, that even the church, see, we have to sometimes pick the lesser evil in this case, and in this case it was to leave the weeds in place, right? So we follow that in our church here at St. John. Most churches uh, follow this kind of lesson. We don't excommunicate, for example, people from a congregation for a deliberate act or to, to take a deliberate act to put them out for little things. In fact, I can say this, in all my years of ministry, I've never participated in an excommunication from any church that I've been part of. We have to take into account, though, that the church, that both the lives of the believers and unbelievers is intertwined, as are the wheat and the weeds in the field. And there could be serious ramifications, right? If one bad actor were removed, when you think of how many people, if it's a big family, for example, you take one out, and then everybody else in the family might go along with them, right? On the other hand, we're kind of in a dilemma here. See, we can't just ignore uh, destructive behavior in the church either. I have the words of 2 Timothy 3.16 in the back of my mind. This is what it says. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, and here's the key, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. Now, why would it say that if there were never a time for reproof or correction? Now, Jesus, for his part, had the perfect plan to deal with this. We go to Matthew 18, verses 15 through 18, where Jesus talks about how to deal with someone who has sinned against you. You start on a one-to-one basis, and if he or she doesn't listen, how to gradually involve more people in a prayerful sense. When we do this out of care and love for the other, what are we trying to do? Well, we're trying to not only correct bad behavior, but more importantly, we're trying to help create a new and a deeper spiritual understanding. Uh, We especially have to remember this in humility. We're all weeds by nature, right? We are, all of us, weeds by nature. How blessed we are. Remember, we should always keep this before us. We're blessed because God's in the business of turning these pernicious weeds into bountiful wheat. Praise the Lord. So, we might be left with a question then. What about, or why would it be necessary to ever separate the weeds from the wheat, you might say? Well, nature gives us a clue about spiritual things in many cases, and it does so here. While the wheat and the tares could not be safely separated when both were growing, in the end, they had to be separated. You might not have known this, but the grain in the bearded darnel, it's slightly poisonous. It causes dizziness and sickness. It has a narcotic effect to it, um, and not to mention that even small amounts of it were bitter and unpleasant to the taste. In the end, 
It was usually separated by hand in biblical times. Women were hired to pick the Darnell grain out of the seed that was going to be milled. As a rule, the separation of the Darnell from the wheat was done after the threshing by spreading the grain out on a large tray set before these women. They were able to pick it out. Why? Because the seed, even though it was looked the same in many ways, was a slightly different color. It was slate gray. See, so what's the lesson from all of this? In the end, the Darnell weed had to be laboriously separated from the wheat or the consequences for this were serious if it wasn't. I want you to recall something and you might even want to jot this down if you want to bring it back to mind. Revelation 21, 27 says this about heaven. Nothing unclean will ever enter it, anyone, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false. What happens then in heaven? We recall in heaven sin ceases to exist. So there has to be an accounting, which our Lord thankfully delays to the end. He gives us every possible chance to repent, and if we refuse, there are serious consequences that will occur. At this point, I thought this, I thought, I wonder if it might be helpful to people gathered here today to sum up the lessons we learn from the parable of the wheat and the tares. These lessons, they're quite important for us to understand in order to be prepared to deal with the world, to have a positive effect, and to continue to extend the Lord's kingdom even when we come face to face with evil. Because it's going to happen, right? going to happen. We have to expect it. So the first thing, what do we realize here? There's always a hostile power in the world, actively seeking, waiting to destroy the good seed and working extremely hard at it. Extremely hard at it. We see them at work on us. If we talk about it, you know, our own lives, we are a combination of the good and the evil and the struggle goes on within us, right? Right? So, what does it all mean? It clearly shows us that we're supposed to be nurturing the good seed in our lives. That we're always going to have to remain, to some extent, on guard. We're always going to have to be looking. Another scene in that movie, The Devil's Advocate, stuck with me. Al Pacino, a.k.a. John Milton, a.k.a. Satan. He says something to this effect. He says, they never see me coming. I rise out of nowhere when no one's paying attention. You see, we on the other hand need to start being able to see with the eyes of God's wisdom, the eyes that the Lord gives us. And at this time in history, think about what's out there in front of us. We have a front row seat to Satan's workshop being played out all around us in the modern world. Most people never saw this coming. I've, I heard somebody say this about their uh, New Year's resolutions for 2020. They said, I didn't prepare in my New Year's resolutions for a pandemic or for you know, the sudden attacks on our police and general law and order that we're seeing. We also have to guard uh, our personal lives because Satan never stops trying to divide and separate us. Think about your own lives for a moment. Just think about this. What are the points of division that have arisen among your family, okay, and among your friends? Just think about that for a moment. So, in summary, there's always an evil power, hostile power in the world. The second thing the parable teaches us, it's difficult, extremely difficult, to make distinctions between those who we think are in the kingdom And those who we're sure are not. We're quick to draw conclusions about people. Now, I look at myself first uh, in an accusatory way on this. How many times have I thought I knew something was true about someone that was negative, only to find out later on I was completely wrong? Humbled in the process. Someone who appears to be very good may in fact not be, while someone who appears to be very bad may in fact be good. What we fail to realize is so often we don't have all the facts. Things aren't always as they seem. and We might, just might not be as wise as we think we are. 
then there's a third principle. It's similar to the second, but uh, a, a little bit different. There is uh, This parable teaches very strongly that um, the, uh, um, the dangerous and the uh, far-reaching consequences of the judgments that we make. Now, if the reapers in our parable had their way, they would have attempted to tear out the darnel um, weeds, you know, along with and in the process of uprooting a lot of the good stuff before the harvest. Jesus clearly tells us there is going, that time is coming. It will come. We can count on it. It's his promise. And that's good news to me because I can rest assured I'm not going to be judged by a single act or a season in my life, nor are you. God's going to look at our whole life. We might have made lots of big mistakes in our lives. But then by the grace of God, perhaps we repented, we reoriented reoriented our lives. We took a different track because of that. God already knows what's coming. So then there's a fourth lesson in this parable. It has to do, again, with this fact that eventually this judgment is going to come. I'm sure, as I thought about this, we've all known people who've gotten away with murder, right? Okay? Um, They don't seem to face any immediate consequences for their evil, and it can often be disheartening. Um, It can really bring us down. When When we see someone who did terrible things that caused harm to other people, and yet they don't get caught. And sometimes it even looks like they're thriving out there in the world. Um, I think for me, one of the worst things is when I think about white collar crime. When someone profits by abusing the system, for example, that, that they were elected to protect. How many corrupt politicians have we all heard about um, many of them, unfortunately, made their home in Illinois. Oh, did I say that? I'm sorry. It slipped out. But how many um, have been corrupt and then law-abiding citizens, what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to bail out the state by increasing our taxes for the mistakes and the greed and the corruption that they instill. That drives me crazy. But we can take heart. Why? Because... Our Lord tells us today, the judgment's coming, do not fear. And then in the new world, it's going to redress the imbalance with the old. Praise the Lord. And the fifth and final thing it teaches us is that the only one with the right to judge is God. I know it's not rocket science. I know you, technically, you already knew this. And remember, though, that God has all the facts. He's able to discern the good from the bad. Why? Because he knows the intent of our hearts. He sees our entire life. Okay? And to me, that spells relief. Why? Because in the end, I don't have to judge others. Therefore, I can focus on what I do have control over. That's my attitude and my behavior toward others. After all, if we leave the judging to God, we can get on with serving. And we can be doing other things to help others. We can unburden ourselves of the weight we so often put upon our own shoulders when we step in and try to make judgments on others. The Lord Jesus, for his part, what does he want from us? He wants us to love others as he loved us. It's as simple and as complicated as that. And one of the ways we do this is to Help to, to, he helps us understand that not only is there uh, this reality of living in this world, but the fact that we're going to encounter evil, no matter what, on his account. But the immense blessing of letting the Lord shoulder the heaviest burdens um, is that he's going to judge fairly and accurately. We do well then to take this parable to heart, to let it sink deep, within our hearts and minds and souls. Everyone, every single one of us has to deal with evil. But you know what? As I think about this, few are able to rise above it. You know, I think that's something only possible when the Holy Spirit comes alongside of us and helps us deal with it. But you know, Jesus tells us that those who do, Those who make that choice, who allow the Holy Spirit to come into their hearts, they're the ones, Jesus says, will shine like the sun 
in the kingdom of the Father. What a relief. What good news. A time is coming when the Lord will execute justice. Amen. Hello, I'm Pastor Kent Hollis. I hope this message was meaningful to you and touched your heart in some way. We encourage you to check out our website at sjlcmetro.com. That's sjlcmetro.com. You can get further information regarding our ministry here at St. John Lutheran Church. And may the Lord bless you richly as you seek to be in relationship with him.